Good afternoon and a warm welcome to our FFA clients and FFA guests. It's a fa fantastic you can all join us this afternoon. This will be FFA's final webinar for 2022. However, we do look forward to next year bringing you more insights from FFA's investment committee. These webinars are a good opportunity for you to get closer to the inner workings of how FFA manage your money and how we not only think about return drivers, but also incorporate important risk mitigators. As usual, joining today are FFA's advisors, Eddie, John, Kieran, and Wilson. 2022 has been a difficult year to be an investor and the forward-looking environment in into 2023 does appear to be challenging economically, with a massive global fiscal activity well and truly coming to an end post COVID. It's hard not to ride the emotions of investment markets, but what I would say is it's important to have confidence in your strategy, stay on top of market developments, and of course, remain diversified. So today we are talking to Aaron Binstead, one of the portfolio managers on the Australian equity team with Lazard Asset Management, of which our clients have exposure to the Lazard Australian Select Fund. We wanna discuss and unpack some of Aaron's thoughts and specifically talk about energy markets and of course, inflation. Please feel free to use the chat function on your screen if you would like to ask a question during the webinar and we will be sure to answer it. So it's important that everyone on this afternoon's webinar understands this session is general in nature and is not personal advice. Of course, should you want more detail, please do not hesitate to contact our office and our advisors will be happy to assist. So please allow me to introduce Aaron Binstead. Aaron commenced working with Lazard as an analyst back in 2002 and became a portfolio manager for the Australian Equity Strategies in 2012. Aaron, welcome. G'day, Ty, great to be with you. Excellent, well, let's kick off. So Aaron, can you tell me a bit about yourself, uh, your background and why you're so passionate about financial markets? Yeah, sure. So I'm uh, I'm, I'm uh, zooming in from Sydney this afternoon. I'm a local Sydney boy. I um, you know, uh, was born and, and, and raised here. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a I'm a football fan, which is why I'm a little bit tired at the moment, given that the World Cup is on. I was uh, watching the the match this morning with my four year old on the couch, so that was good fun. Very um, keen. Yeah, so I got um I got into financial markets um in a pretty sort of sort of standard and, and boring way. I guess my old man was involved in financial markets, so you know discussions about markets and economics and all that around the around the dinner table and that sort of thing, which which got me an interest. Um, you know studied that at uni and pretty much got into investing as soon as I could partway through my uni degree. And, you know, as my little, my very short kind of bio year at the start uh, shows, I, I kind of haven't found something better to do since then. So that's, uh, that's my journey to, to where we are today. It quite often drops up with, um, you know, fathers or mothers being involved in industry. I was very similar to you, actually. Um, you know, my father being in industry and certainly uh, at the dinner table talking uh, financial markets, investment strategies, um, all the way through through my my teenage years and um, obviously well into adulthood, adulthood. So we certainly are aligned there, Aaron. Uh, interesting. Um, thanks. So let's talk about the performance of the Lazard Australian Select Fund which our clients have exposure to. It's clearly done well over the past 12 months. Can you shed some light on what sectors and stocks have performed particularly well? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's two ways I'd unpack that. One is to look at the dynamics of the, of the broader market and then sort of look in at the portfolio. So if I just focus on the market to start with, from, from sort of, I'd say from 2018, we were starting to say that you know, some parts of the equity market in general were starting to look a bit stretched and overvaluation risks were creeping in. That really got quite extreme um, into, in 2019, 2020 and peaking in 2021. In fact, at that stage, we were saying that some sectors of global equity markets looked quite like the uh, tech, media and telco bubble in 99, 2000. Some sort of stocks were very expensive and we were writing that we didn't think that was sustainable and there was lots of risk there. That sort of has really come to the fore in 2022. 
um, those sectors really have have fallen a lot. Um, given we don't speculate as in a portfolio management team, we buy fundamentals or long-term cash flows. It meant that we weren't in those stocks. Um, that obviously meant we trailed the market in that sort of 2020, 2021 period, but we really got the benefit from not being hurt by that process in 22. Um, just for some context, we still think that there's a lot of that adjustment to go. We still think that we, you know, uh, perhaps only one third to, to halfway through that adjustment, but not having those stocks um, really helped us. And then on the other side, we had a lot of businesses that did really well. So we weren't in sort of loss making speculative businesses that had a tough time. We bought lots of sustainable businesses with really good cash flows, um, you know, businesses like Metcash, uh, QBE, Computer Share. Uh, just solid businesses that you can rely on. And one particular sector that did very well for us was energy. So that's something we can perhaps go into a bit more later, um, later. but we thought that given energy had a really tough time in 2020 with, with lockdowns and, and the world stopping moving, energy was in a difficult spot, but that really sowed the seeds for what we think is gonna be a great long-term investment backdrop. And that started to pay handsomely in 2022. So that was a key driver to the portfolio. Excellent. So in periods of heightened volatility, the benefits of active management can really come to the fore. Can you talk through your experiences during these environments and touch on some, some of your key learnings? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been with the business for about 20 years. Um, my uh, partners in the business have, uh, you know, uh, either a bit greyer or, or bolder than me. So they've been around a little bit longer. Um, and I think if you look at some big turning points in markets historically, it shows you where you really can, if you've got discipline gain over the long term. I mentioned the tech media telco bubble in 99, 2000. So I came in just as that was was finishing, um, but my colleagues sort of lived through that that process. And that was a time where people really could make some big mistakes if they jumped on board. At the same time, if you maintain your discipline, it really helped you. Similarly, um, in, the middle of the China boom at that stage, we um, had sold out of commodities. We thought that they were, you know, very well priced. We'd hold them, held them for a number of years beforehand. Uh, and then they subsequently did quite poorly afterwards. Um, similarly, you know, banks from about 2015 were very highly valued um, and we were able to not be in the banks. We were very underweight. Um, and being able to be different from the index really made um, a, a significant difference to our clients' long-term returns. But as you mentioned, Ty, being active, it means that when you make these calls, you may experience some short-term periods where you're, you're behind the index. I referenced that we were um, behind the index in, say, 2019 and 2020. That has absolutely proven to be the right decision given what's happened in 22 and what we expect to happen in 23 and beyond. But so there are short term times where you do lag, but over the long run, we think it's the best way to both preserve and defend capital and produce long run returns. Um, you know, we were up less than the market in, in, in 2020, but we were, had a good positive year when the market fell a lot. So low beta depending, defending capital, but to do that, you need to be active, you need to be different. Yeah, you mentioned in 2019 at the investment committee level, um, and for our clients to understand, our investment committee is centralised. We have two independent asset consultants, a responsible entity, and um, I, I chair that meeting. And there were some difficult discussions around 2019, and um, we we weren't making any quick decisions, but we did a lot of analysis around the value um, tilt that um, Lazard Australian Select Fund has, and we came to the conclusion as a, as a collective that we would remain and hold steady and gee we've been rewarded handsomely from that so that's been um that's been good to see um but also you know really really important point that we don't make uh, we can make quick decisions at investment committee level um but sometimes we we, we don't want to make quick decisions also so depending on 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 where we sit with certain things will depend on how we react um and 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 move from there so you bring up a really good really good point there aaron I think um, Kieran is going to ask a question. Over to you, Kieran. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I appreciate your comments. And um, yeah, it's great just to hear about your insights and, and outlook over the coming years. Just want to see, was there anything that's keeping you personally up at night around investing um, 
right now or potentially over the coming few months? So I'd say uh, with investing, um, you know, I generally have confidence that if you buy good businesses for reasonable prices over the long run, you'll do okay. Um, that the main thing is being able to explain to people, you know, what happens in the interim and make sure that they're comfortable to, to realize that long run return. So I'd say that's just a very big picture comment. In terms of what we're going through specifically at the moment, um, you know, Ty mentioned in his introduction and we'll perhaps delve into it a little bit more later, but I do think there are quite a few economic headwinds, you know, uh, coming down the pipe for 2023. Uh, and I think managing that risk uh, in portfolios is going to be really important, uh, you know, particularly with the, the quite aggressive interest rate increases we've seen. So I'd say that's that's one thing we're being, you know, very, very mindful of in the portfolio. Thank you, Aaron. So there are mixed messages around Australian market valuation. What is your take on on broad valuations given given the backdrop? Yeah, sure. So. The simple one-liner is that on a long-run basis, the Australian market looks okay value. Um, you know, not not crazy, not ridiculous, and not not super attractive. Um, one thing, there's kind of two provisors I need to put there. I'd say that the US market still does look quite overvalued. It has come back from where it was, but it was really extreme. Given the US is the dominant equity market, if it if it falls a lot, you'd expect that we could be pull, be pulled down a little bit. So that's one proviso. And secondly, as I mentioned, I do think there are there are quite significant earnings risks next year. So, you know, we know that valuation doesn't really tell you anything about your return on a one to three year view, but from five years out up to eight years, it pretty much dominates your return. So even if you say, you know, you'll get an okay average return buying the index today on an eight year view, you may have a difficult period next year or the year after if the economy is tough. So um, that's something, you know, I, I think we all need to, to have in mind, um, even though on a long run view, it doesn't look too, too bad. The other thing I'd say is there's quite a bit of difference between different sectors. So we have some sectors of the market that have really strong earnings. So our material sector and our energy sector has very strong earnings right now, um, which makes the, I guess, flatters the market in aggregate. And there are still some sectors um, that are quite overvalued. So just, just to kind of throw out one example, our healthcare sector, which has got a lot of very good companies in it, um, it's still trading on a, on a long run, on a, excuse me, PE multiple about 37 times. Whereas if you just look at a simple long run number, uh, it's probably traded on kind of the mid twenties. Um, so there's still quite a bit of valuation risk in that one sector. And there's a few others like that. So I just generally say aggregate level, okay. Uh, earnings risks risk next year, but I think you want to be quite careful about which sectors you're exposed to. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, John has a question. John. Hey, Aaron. Great info. Thanks for the thanks for the session. Um, compared to some of the managers, I notice you have quite a differentiated investment process. How do you dissect markets and and analyze stocks? Yeah, thanks, John. Look, we obviously, having been in the the investment game for sort of two decades, we we have interactions with lots of you know consultants and people who evaluate fund managers and. A consistent bit of feedback we get is that we typically have a very unique uh, return profile. Our, our performance is quite differentiated. And one of the, the features that people reference to us is where typically we look long-term, we're a very long-term manager. We invest for that sort of long-term sustainable business um, model and return, which is why, you know, we can perform differently. You know, for example, just referencing this year, a lot of managers had a difficult time, but we had a really, really strong year. Um, so that's that's something that you know makes us different. Uh, we're also very fundamental. Um, we're not trying to pick which sectors are popular or, or what sectors the market's going to like. We really buy long run valuations and cash flows and business models, and we're very disciplined. Um, there's a there's a key uh, differentiator you need to make between being disciplined and, and stubborn. It's just being stubborn and saying you know we're right and I'm not listening to anyone is you know a road to a road to failure, but Having discipline, continuing to test your assumptions is really important. And I'd say that's another thing um, that sort of we're known for is while we'll continually test our views and make sure that things haven't changed and, and change them where we need to, if we continually think our view is being validated, we'll, we'll really back that and have the patience to see that come through. 
Yeah, certainly at the investment committee level um, for our clients' benefit, the way we blend our portfolios or our managed accounts, um, you know, we have a situation where we don't want to, I use the cricket analogy all the time, Aaron, is that we don't want to dance on the pitch and and smash a six over the fence because you can lose your stumps. It's important to be very well diversified and be smart about the returns you're chasing um, and making sure you have risk um, in, in, in the forefront. So, um Absolutely agree with all, all, all that you said there. So in terms of um, impacts closer to, to home, Aaron, China's weakened economy is definitely a problem for the Australian economy in that 40% of our experts, sorry, experts, exports um, go to China and we're largely an export dependent economy. How is the portfolio dealing with these headwinds? Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, Ty, so I've got a situation where I think the, the global economy is, is slowing. Um, and that creates lots of cyclical risks. Uh, at the same time, China has been in, you know, a very tough COVID lockdown period for, for, you know, pretty much two years. And it looks like while there've been some false starts, so we've got to just, just wait and see how it plays out. It does look like they are opening. So we actually may get a bit of a counter cyclical effect from China reopening to the world. Um, it's interesting that they're just starting to open up as their export growth is really dropping off. The huge government stimulus we saw in, in predominantly Western countries really drove a massive boom in China exports in 2021 and 2022. That's now really dropped off. Um, and so now the pressure is potentially there to, to kind of grow the domestic economy from domestic demand. So we may actually see that China is a net positive um, for 2023 when the world is getting slower. Um, it's going to be a really complex um, complex way this plays out and we need to again look look differently through different sectors so iron ore is probably our um it's our second biggest export now after energy energy's just pipped pipped the pipped it at the post for 2022 but so iron ore's had a big bounce towards the end of the year primarily on china reopening i do think the outlook is better there but we're still relatively cautious on housing starts we think that housing starts, which is the, the biggest driver of steel demand and, and therefore iron ore demand can go up a little bit next year, but we would caution against a really strong recovery. Uh, but even so, you've got to be impressed about how resilient iron ore prices have been, even with China being quite weak. Um, energy is something um, that I'll just put a pause on for now, because I'll, I'll hopefully address that a bit later, but, but the dynamic with China and energy markets is going to be very interesting. Mm. And then there's some sort of company specifics. You know, we know that certain companies and exports have been locked out of China for political reasons. We haven't seen any uh, concrete changes yet, but clearly it does look like Australia and, and the Chinese um, governments are being a bit more friendly. So there may be some countries that get access back to that big market and that could play out on a company specific level. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. So in terms of the um, the market um, and macro backdrop, has simply changed over the last 12 months and what can we expect you know, going forward in relation to higher and more volatile inflation and rising and rising rates, um, Aaron? Yeah, absolutely. So I think if we just track back a couple of years, uh, we obviously saw COVID and the lockdowns, which is just a huge disruption uh, for everybody. Then, then we saw just, you know, huge, huge government stimulus. Um, you know, Bank of America and the US estimate that with including fiscal and monetary stimulus, if you add up what every government did around the world, you're talking something like 25% of global GDP. So it's just absolutely astronomical. Um, large parts of that was, was giving people money to spend. Um, that created a demand boom. Um, you know, perhaps in hindsight, not surprisingly, that that led to inflation. So I should just say here, we were writing about inflation risk in our public documentation in October 2020. So I feel like we were, you know, sort of alert to that relatively early. Um, the key uh, risk with inflation, or one of the key risks, I should say, is that it requires interest rate increases to to get rid of, uh, to get rid of it by reducing demand. We've seen the fastest interest rate hike cycle in you know in living memory. Uh, it's been really, really rapid. That is starting to impact economies just now. We haven't really had much uh, increase, um, excuse me, stress in economies yet. You have seen some valuation impact in markets. So, you know, for example, if I just reference the S and P 500 in the, in the US, you've seen a significant fall in the PE multiple of that market. 
again, just if I talk really, really generally from sort of the mid twenties level to the, to a high teens, high to mid teens level, that has been driven by higher interest rates. Uh, but we haven't really seen the economic impact of those higher interest rates yet. Um, that's of getting some very early data that's starting to happen with some um, early easing in the US labor market. And even anecdotally in Australia, we're starting to see some very early signs of perhaps decreased consumption in some more sensitive sectors. But for all intents and purposes, it hasn't hit our economy yet. Um, and it's really a 2023 story. There's kind of two views about how this is going to play out. Um, both, both views say that the key thing is inflation has to fall. Um, again, if I reference the US, just because it's more commented on, we have roughly about, you know, um, eight to nine million job openings in the US, which is which is too much relative to the pool of, of, of available labour. The most bullish for equity markets is that those job openings fall, which decreases labour demand, which decreases wage growth without unemployment going up. Um, that's, I'd say, that's a fairly commonly held view. Um, the other view is that job openings have never fallen before without unemployment rising. And the only way to lower um, job openings and wage growth is by increasing unemployment. History would suggest that um, to drop CPI by, by you know, two to three percent, you need to increase the unemployment rate by about two percent, which would wow. result in, in that, a that, US recession. Big. Yeah, yeah okay. that's what history would suggest. Mm. Um, now, in the US, wages are growing too fast right now to hit the CPI target for the US. You just mathematically can't make it work with wages growing, you know, four, four and a half, five percent. The Fed must get wage growth lower to return to the inflation target. So it's either one of those two ways that it can happen. Australia, we obviously are a bit behind in terms of firstly seeing our inflation and then our interest rates going up. We have not seen this, the strong wage growth yet that has happened in the US or indeed across the ditch in New Zealand. The last couple of wages numbers have not been alarming, but they're a bit higher than what the RBA was expecting. So it is possible that like we saw with inflation and interest rates, we're again just a bit behind on wage growth. Um, and there has been some commentary, which I think you know, is worth um, considering that Australia has a more sort of structurally embedded wage growth profile because we're very regulated and reference the minimum wage. So increases typically come through with a lag. So it's possible that we may see our wage growth persisting uh, longer and indeed kicking in, um, you know, more next year. But that's still a question mark, whereas it's it's already happening in the US. It's a question mark for us. So I'd say that's the, Ty, that's the big, big story for next year is can we lower wage growth without pushing unemployment up too much? Yeah. So I've just been um, told by Rebecca that the chat box has been down. It's now back up. So the audience out there, if you do have a question, I remind you to type that in your chat, chat box and, and we'll endeavour to, to answer answer that. It's interesting uh, in that question, you, you, you referenced, you know, ma the market, the investment market environment versus the economic environment. Um, and like all our advisors, we, we, we do tell our clients that there's two, there are two distinct markets and share markets or investment markets are forward thinking mechanisms. So what you find is the economy is going on going along swimmingly potentially with, with market potentially faltering. Um, and then when the economy starts to really wane, markets can see through that. Um, and as that forward, forward, mechan forward looking mechanism, um, generally you can see start, markets see through that um, and 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 start to take a bit of a more of an uplift in, in due course. So it's just an interesting um, interesting thing to consider uh, when you know the economic uh, period may maybe not so great. It may may still mean that investor markets start to start to improve over time. So just more of a, a, a mental note more than anything. Yeah, absolutely. And typically, you know, equity markets will bottom sort of at least six months before the economy bottoms and equity markets often rally while you're still in a recession because as you say Ty they're, they're forward looking so that's a, that's 100% right. So there really is an obsession with long-term investing and almost a back-to-basis approach to investing. How do you navigate the blend between long-term and you know taking on short-term advantages in the fund? I know you mentioned that you know we are a, a value-based fund, but you know, there's obviously short-term opportunities. How do you balance those two 
two periods up. Yeah, sure. So I'd say, you know, the back to basics investing, I would call it back to back to sanity in, <laughs> investing in some ways. So what we saw in, you know, 2020 and, 20, and 2021 really was absolutely crazy. We had loss making businesses with, you know, tens of billions of dollars of market cap. Um, you know, think about think about cryptocurrency, how much money supposedly cryptocurrency was worth. Uh, you had bankrupt companies raising equity. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you, you know how how much publicity got generally in Australia, but there's things in the US called SPACs that special peer purpose acquisition companies that they're just cash boxes that people are listing on the New York Stock Exchange and they just say we're going to invest in this type of thing, and people would give them billion, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars just throw it in a cash box and then the management will later go and work out what they were doing and billions was raised like this. It was absolutely crazy stuff was happening. The best performing stocks in 2020 and 2021 were negative cash flow, negative EPS revisions and high equity issuance. If you said, you know, I've got some great investment ideas for you and here are my three, two dot points, I think it'd be a really short meeting. Um, whereas what's been happening this year is, you know, a really strange concept like cash flow, <laughs> dividends, you know, good balance sheet, you know, these things are back back in vogue. So, you know, that's why I call it, call it Ty called the back to sane investing. Yeah. Um, so fundamentals. Look, yeah, fundamentals, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, and I think we're still in that process. Markets don't make that adjustment straight away. As I mentioned at the start, we're probably one third to halfway through that adjustment. Um, so I think there's more to come. Um, so look, we always assume that we're going to own something for the long term, but if some if some investment where we can see a catalyst in the short run pops up, we'll absolutely take um, you know take an advantage of that. Just one that kind of comes to mind. Uh, not that it's a particularly exciting example, but you know we um, historically owned a lot of toll roads. Um, just recently, we sold out of our last one. This is when I say recently, it actually wasn't that, that recent, probably at least six months ago, but Atlas Arteria is a toll road. Um, a big investor came along and, and was offering for our, st our stake at a really um, high price. Um, we could see how that even at that high price, you could make a good return, um, but we thought there were some near-term headwinds for the business. Um, so we sold out. Uh, since then, the share price has fallen a lot. And while it hasn't quite qualified for our select portfolio yet, because that's the best idea is narrow universe, in some of our more diversified funds, we've, we've started to buy that back at a much lower price. Um, that, that may be the case if it reaches the you know, threshold for select, but that's an example of taking an opportunity of a shareholder who you know, wanted to come in and pay a big premium short term. Yeah. So Aaron, before we um, move on to energy and you can share your screen and, and show our audience um, some illustrations. Uh, you you mentioned um, not so long ago that you prefer, um, you know, insurers over banks. Can you sort of delve into that for us? Yeah. So this um, absolutely. So this kind of goes into my my comments about uh, potential economic headwinds earlier. Um, so banks and insurers generally both benefit from higher interest rates. So. Banks make money by, you know, charging people interest. As the, you, um, you know, I'm sure everyone's aware that as the RBA lifts the cash rate, banks can uh, put up their mortgage rates. They often reference the cash rate, um, so they get they get a better net net interest margin. Um, so they've got some positive leverage to higher interest rates. So do insurers generally because they the money that people give them as premiums they invest in bonds, and if the bonds are earning higher interest rates, they get more income. So they've both got that positive leverage. What one key difference is that if an economy is tough, you know, banks uh, can have to write off loans. They have bad debts expense. Through COVID, because the economy was so strong, excuse me, and um, and governments were giving people money, bad debt expense was very, very low. It's sort of about, you know, they actually had to, they had negative bad debts because they had to write some back. So bad debts in the PL of banks are really, really low at the moment. You know, the market's only forecasting about 11 basis points. Um, whereas if in a difficult uh, economic environment, it can easily go much, much higher, uh, which really would be a headwind for bank earnings. Insurers in contrast don't have that risk profile. So if you think about uh, your insurance, your car insurance, your uh, home insurance, you really have to be in a very difficult situation not to uh, purchase those. Um, and if, you know, if a bank has a customer go broke, they have to write off a loan 
there's a big hit on their balance sheet. If an insurance business loses a customer, they just lose the future income. There's the, there's not that impact on the balance sheet. So they don't have that economic risk. So I'd say that's really simply how we're looking at those two different sectors of the market at the moment. Thanks, Aaron. So let's talk about energy. Can you talk about the Australian energy transition and what that means for the sector and importantly, consumers, you know, going forward. So perhaps you can share screen and, and provide some insight there. Yeah, absolutely. Let me just firstly see if I can get this. Uh... Now let's see, is that, is that coming up now, Ty? Sure is. Great. So I'll, I'll reference this um, slide in a moment. This is just where I'll start the discussion, but let me just, just go to Australia to begin with. Um, in terms of where we're invested in the market, the Australian, what's happening in specifically in Australia is, is not very relevant. Um, it's really relevant if you're invested in the local utilities, be it your origins or, or AGLs, that's, that's not where um, we see the best opportunity at the moment. So Australia's domestic policy is not specifically that relevant. What is very, very relevant, and Australia obviously you know, plays into this is in, consistent with this, is the global energy transition. So I'd say this is one of the big themes in our portfolio. Um, and I can you know, go into some of the ways that, that otherwise that comes out. Um, but the world has dramatically reduced the amount of investment it is making in its traditional uh, energy sources, which obviously are fossil fuels. Roughly about, you know, a bit over 80% of the world's energy comes from fossil fuels today. What the Western world has done basically has stopped the investment in fossil fuels, but is not yet investing in enough renewables to offset that decline in the old capacity. This means that we've got uh, energy shortages, uh, which are gonna persist for quite a long time, um, which sort of brings me to this first slide I've put up, which I'll, I'll you know, endeavor to explain now. So this is looking at uh, the US energy sector. So the US listed energy sector and that squiggly line you can see going up and down, up and down looks at the ratio of the capital investment of the US energy sector relative to the depreciation of that sector. So just as a reference point, oil and gas typically de depletes at about 5% per annum. So if you spend $0, your production falls by 5% every year. So you've got to spend a lot of money just to stand still. Now, if you look over time, you can see that where we are uh, in 2020, 2021 was very, very low in a historic context. So that's just demonstrating that point that I mentioned um, that we've really cut our investment in our traditional energy sources. Now, the, uh, there are various forecasts that think we need to spend about four to five trillion dollars a year on renewables and you know future facing energy to um, meet our, to meet our needs, our energy needs because we're not investing in fossil fuels anymore. There's various different various ways to cut it. We're probably at best only spending half that amount. So we're just not spending enough to make up for this fall in fossil fuels. This is really the key to our energy thesis. Um, and the problem with this underinvestment is that it probably takes five to six years if you decide tomorrow to bring more energy online. And just a way to kind of hopefully bring that out. If you think of some of those big LNG projects Australia has you know, built over the years, from when the decision's made to when the, the gas is being shipped, it's about, it's about a five year process. So once you're short energy, it takes a long, long time uh, for it to uh, for that to change. Even now, what what is very interesting is that normally, you know, you, you look at these cycles historically. Um, so if you look at reference the early 70s, um, that's when we had the um, the first uh, oil embargo. So we had the Yom Kippur War, and the Arab countries responded by cutting their oil production. We had a huge spike in oil prices. Uh, you can see the increase in that line here that I'm sort of highlighting in 76 to 78. And then again, later, here you have the Iran-Iraq war and another Saudi Arabian cut. Oil prices were very, very high and companies responded to that price signal by investing a lot in capacity. So lots of Western countries and companies invested a lot of money. A lot of oil was brought online and the oil price crashed and so, in, and so um, capital spending fell. We know that energy prices now are very, very high. 
but there's no price response at the moment. Because of the energy transition, there's been no increase in investment. So there's a real discipline in terms of bringing on supply, which we think all else equal is going to mean that this could be quite an extended uh, energy, energy um, price cycle. There's sort of precedent for this historically. Um, you know, this is just something that's, that Credit Suisse put together a while ago. You know, when you do have these long energy cycles, they typically go for a, for a decade. Um, and even if, if you look at these shorter cycles here, I would argue that from December 98 to 16 was really a long cycle. It was just punctuated by the GFC. Um, oil, once we recovered from the GFC, it just went straight back to over $100. It was just sort of that, that short-term demand shock. Um, but either way, when you get these underinvestment cycles, you can see that period I referenced before, it took a decade to fix. Mm -hmm. It's the same as what happened in the in the 90s. Now, I referenced that we're quite concerned about the global economy next year. Energy is a cyclical sector. So I think it's a, it's a really sensible question to ask someone like me to say, hey, you've told me you're worried about the economy. What on earth are you do, doing talking about energy? Um, energy is cyclical. If we have a downturn, there'll be an impact. Um, and so I think that's that's a good question. So this is just looking at the change in oil demand through different recessions through time. The largest obviously was the COVID-19 lockdowns. That was really not related to demand per se. We just stopped driving, stopped flying, et cetera. And we saw about a 9% decline in oil demand. These three recessions here I've highlighted in light blue, these were really where we were short energy, where there was supply was crunched, that meant energy prices went up, which caused the recession. So they weren't really demand led. Uh, and I referenced some of those before. That brings sort of these recessions and even 74, this one here, you could argue that high energy prices had a big, uh, big part um, to play there, which leaves these sort of bottom five recessions, uh, which I'm sure many of you will, will recognize. You're talking about a sort of two zero, you know, 0.4 to 2% demand reduction, um, excuse me, um, reduction to oil demand just from a normal recession where demand falls. Um, and it's different, as I mentioned, to these supply constraint um, reductions. We, we earlier in our discussion about China talked about the dynamic of Chinese uh, lockdowns and reopening. This is a bit of a busy chart, so I'll just, just try and make it simple. This is from Goldman Sachs. And this is just them saying, just from China reopening um, and other countries reopening, what is the impact on oil demand? Um, and if you look at these red bars here and just green for reopening, they think that um, obviously 2022 is um, almost over, but there's gonna be about 2 million barrels um, of demand, mostly from reopening type activity. So jet fuel is one, China's another, um, and other re reopening um, combined with that. So jet fuel, before COVID, we were using about 7 million barrels a day of oil for jet fuel. Obviously that went to pretty much, um, not literally zero, but close to zero in COVID. We're running at about 5 million barrels a day of demand now. China's actually a big contributor to that because they're not, they're doing very little uh, international flying. So as that picks up and their general reopening, we have about, call it 2 million barrels of demand expected. The global oil market is about a uh, bit over 100 million barrels a day right now. And if you reference that demand contraction I saw from, I mentioned from recessions, that's about 2% or 2 million barrels. So just from reopening, even with a tough economic situation, you can see um, a demand support there if we do have a recession. This, um, this chart here is, is a sort of a scenario matrix, uh, again, from Goldman Sachs that is looking at different um, oil growth demand scenarios for, for 2023. Now this is global real GDP X China, and this is a Brent oil price. So all else you can see if the oil price is higher, and this is how much oil, million barrels a day of oil um, is demand is expected. If the oil price is higher, demand will be lower. This, you know, it's too expensive. And if GDP growth is lower, oil, oil growth is lower. Now, 2% global growth is really a recession um, because you've got to think of emerging markets. They have much higher growth. And yeah. this is Goldman's forecast. They, they can be wrong, they can be right. But even if you think we have a very slow global environment and the Brent oil price is 125, which is much higher than where we are today, they still see about 2 million barrels of oil. 
So there really are some quite strong, you know, demand growth for next year. And then just translating that to the to the equity market, um, I just maybe finish on this one and and let me explain it here because it's a little bit a little bit busy. So this sort of green line is the inflation adjusted Brent oil price. So you can see from sort of 2002 to 2008, this is that great China commodity boom. We saw commodity um, oil prices really rocket. This is the GFC period. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we had that really quick recovery and oil prices stayed high for you know a good another four years. Here is where the investment that was made during the China boom finally came online and, and crashed the oil price. Um, and we've had it sort of stabilized. This is COVID when oil really crashed. And um, this is the spike we've seen now. Apologies, this chart's a little bit old now. The oil price is sort of around $80 today. So think of it about here. This dark blue line is the performance of energy shares against the general ASX market. So if this line is going up, energy shares are doing better than the market. And if the line's going down, energy shares are doing worse than the market. So unsurprisingly, when the oil price is strong, energy shares do well. When the oil price is weak, energy shares underperform. The main point of this chart is that energy shares have not come close to keeping up with the inflation of the or the growth in the commodity price. Um, now, 2022, if you read the commentary, everyone will say, and it's true, that energy has been a star performer. Um, it has a lot in the tank compared to what's happened with the underlying commodity. Um, and so putting all that together, I hopefully goes to show why we're so positive uh, on the sector going forward. And I should say that our exposure is primarily for gas um, because you know gas in Asia has structural demand growth even with the, the energy transition. And I can ex expand on that if that'd be uh, of interest. So I do like your recent pun, a lot left in the tank. <laughs> um, we're talking about oil. Um, wonderful insights there, um, yeah, Aaron. Really appreciate it. So I think today, you know, I think we'll make it make it a close there, given everyone's time. I really want to thank um, you, Aaron, for spending some time with FFA and, and our clients' community today to bring them closer to the mechanics and, in particular, your focus on how you manage the Australian Select Fund. Just wanted to say, keep up the impressive numbers. Um, but as you know, uh, we are well diversified in our broader manage accounts to make sure we're, um, we're, we're keeping that into play. And to all our FFA clients, on behalf of our investment committee and the broader FFA team, we thank you for dialing into this webinar. The team wish you a happy festive season and a fantastic start to the new year. Bye for now.